Commissioners, please be seated. The rest of you sit down. Thank you, Sue. Jack and Betty in the back, sit down. Okay. Congressman Hamilton, sir. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Tim. We've heard a lot about the uh, accidents at Fukushima and uh, what steps are being taken by our government to try to learn from that. Uh, we've appreciated the testimony that we have had. Uh, we, General Scowcroft and I would like to assign to the Transportation and Storage Subcommittee uh, the, to take the lead for the Commission in following the situation in Japan and making recommendations later this year regarding those matters that fall within the scope of the Commission's review. I, I presume, uh, Dick and Phil, you're prepared to take that responsibility. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Your eagerness impresses the chairman. Uh, uh -huh. uh, in just a moment, we'll turn to the presentations by the co-chairman of these subcommittees who will brief us on the recommendations that are emerging thus far from their work. And we'll ask the co-chairman of the three committees over the period of the next few hours to speak from their seats so we can promote uh, the discussion. Uh, before we do that, I want to express my thanks and the thanks of General Scowcroft for the staff report on what we've heard. Uh, the staff prepared and issued that report at the direction of the Commission so that we could be confident that we understood the major concerns of our different stakeholders and the public before we issued our draft report to the Secretary of Energy uh, at the end of July. Uh, we've had a lot of feedback to that report. We're deeply appreciative of those who have responded. Uh, we found their comments helpful and useful to us, and I think they will strengthen the work of the Commission. Now, as we move into the subcommittee reports, I want to say that the subcommittee co-chairs and the members of the subcommittees have really done remarkable work uh, thus far investigating uh, the challenging issues that each of them confronted. The co-chairs of the three committees have done outstanding work in bringing the uh, subcommittees together, and uh, the subcommittees appear to be working together very nicely. That's a testament to the leadership of the subcommittee co-chairs. Uh, I believe we are moving towards an agreement of meaning, a meaningful set of recommendations for the full commission to consider in a few weeks. So I express my thanks to the subcommittee chairman and the members of the committees. We've asked the subcommittee co-chairs to brief us today on the recommendations that their subcommittees will offer for consideration by the full commission. Following today's discussion, we'll ask that the subcommittees adjust their recommendations as they see fit and prepare their draft sub subcommittee reports for release by the end of this month. Today's presentations and the draft reports of the subcommittees will be posted on our website for public review and comment. We'll use the subcommittee reports and the comments re we receive as the basis for the draft report of the full commission, which is due to the Secretary of Energy at the end of July. I want to remind everyone that the recommendations emerging from the subcommittees may or may not be adopted by the full commission. In any event, the work of the subcommittees will help inform but not substitute for the report of the full commission. After today's discussion, we will integrate the work of the subcommittees and the views expressed here today into a coherent and actionable draft report for public release at the end of July. We will announce our plans and schedule for receiving comment on the draft report of the full commission shortly after we, we release the report. Depending on the feedback we receive, we may decide to hold meetings of the full commission or of subcommittees to further investigate a particular issue. We will ask our subcommittees to finalize their reports later this year, and we will issue our final report by January 2012, uh, the deadline established by the Secretary. The public can track these and other developments through our website, 
which has recently undergone a series of improvements intended to better communicate to all who are interested. The site may be found at uh, www.brc.gov. With that, we'll ask Commissioners Meserve and Sharp to review the recommendations that are emerging from the work of the Transportation and Storage Subcommittee. Uh, Richard, you're going to begin. Yes. yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you've indicated, Phil Sharp and I were the co-chairs of this effort, and we're going to be, we plan to share the stage here this morning. Um, I'll start us off, and then we'll pass the baton to Phil, and of course I'll allow him to answer all the questions. <laughs> uh, it's my, my intention this morning is to uh, basically uh, explain how we've gone through our work, and let me emphasize at the outset that these are the draft recommendations. Uh, we anticipate that they will be illuminated by consideration among the full commission and by the public comments we hear today. So our, our function here today is to solicit comment on what clearly should be seen as drafts uh, and ones that could be evolved as we go forward. Um, this is a, just a quick reminder of all those who have, have served on this subcommittee. Uh, the, uh, this has been a hard-working group that uh, we very much appreciate all of the input that they provided to us, and I think that after Phil and I are uh, finished, we invite the other members of the subcommittee to uh, augment our, our comments as they, they deem appropriate. Um, the, the central question that we have tried to address is whether the United States should change its approach to storing and transmitting spent nuclear fuel and high-level waste. Uh, well, one or more permanent disposal uh, facilities are established. In a certain sense, we've been doing this basically accidentally or maybe without a conscious decision for over 50 years. It's, uh, there has not been places to move the material, and we've been doing both storage and transportation over this, this, uh, this time. And I guess the question that we've been addressing is whether this sort of accidental strategy is one that ought to be augmented and enhanced, in particular with regard to the possibility of interim consolidated storage. In order to uh, complete our work, um, we have had a, uh, a, a variety of meetings. Uh, we went to Wiscasset, Maine. You may wonder, some of the audience may wonder why. That is the <coughs> location of the former Maine Yankee power plant, uh, where the complete reactor has been decommissioned and all that's left there is a uh, a, a facility for the uh, dry cast storage of the fuel. We had uh, two meetings here in Washington at which we heard uh, extensive testimony, as we had it as well in Wiscasset. We had a, a meeting in Chicago. Uh, Chicago was a very logical location for us to discuss and focus on transportation, because it is a, a transportation hub. And we had a deliberative session in January we did have the benefit of other meetings. Uh, obviously, the various commission meetings uh, did not, uh, were not ones that where storage and transportation uh, escaped notice. Uh, and we had the benefit of a classified briefing for those members of the committee that have had clearances uh, to deal in particular with the security issues that are associated with transportation and storage. So it, our input has included information from dozens of witnesses, a lot of comments that have been submitted. Uh, there's commission papers uh, that have come to the group. And let me say for the benefit of the audience, if you're not aware of it, there, and as the chairman indicated, there is a website that has all of this material uh, that is on it. So all of the input that we have received, other than the classified input, is, uh, is available for uh, public review. I'm going to spend a fair amount of time on our draft recommendation, which really I think is the central recommendation that comes up out of our, our, our group, which is that the United States should proceed expeditiously to establish one or more consolidated interim storage facilities as part of an integrated comprehensive plan for managing the back end of the fuel cycle. Uh, there are a variety of reasons, I think, that support this draft recommendation. First. Uh, creating this kind of a storage capability preserves options. It enhances the flexibility to uh, be able to adapt to circumstances and to respond to other aspects of an integrated waste management system. 
uh, as we'll be discussing later today that in connection with some of our other reports that there'll be consideration of whether we ultimately should view the spent fuel as a waste or as a resource, uh, whether we perhaps should recycle it. While that is being determined, storage helps to preserve the option of going in either direction depending on what we learn. We have demonstrated that we can store this material safely and securely so that preserving that option doesn't present uh, untoward risks. And as it happens, storing the fuel makes the ultimate disposal uh, decision somewhat easier in that the fuel is cooling. And so it reduces the siting challenge for a disposal facility or provides the opportunity to increase the capacity of a given uh, disposal site. The second factor that I think that supports this recommendation is that consolidated storage allows the removal of fuel from decommissioned sites. I mentioned that we had gone to Wiscasset and we heard testimony from the local citizenry there. To a certain sense, it felt that a breach of an understanding they'd had when there was an operating reactor had been, had been, uh, had been achieved. Um, there's nothing there but fuel. They've lost the tax benefits of the jobs that came with the facility. It was not part of the bargain. And we, there are nine such sites for, for just decommissioned fuel sites existence today where similarly the benefits to the communities have been substantially reduced. Removal allow those communities to make beneficial use of that land. Uh, and as it happens, there are efficiencies that arise in moving the fuel to a consolidated interim site and that after you've stopped being able to piggyback on the security capacity that exists at the nuclear power plant, then there are very large costs associated with just the security that now has to be carried by just the spent fuel facility. Uh, so there are some efficiencies that could be uh, achieved by centralizing the material. In fact, it may well turn out, and we have some studies that are on our website to show this, that in fact you could save money by building a site in which it could, material could be consolidated because of the reduced aggregate cost for uh, chiefly security. The third factor that supports this recommendation is that consolidated storage would enable DOE to start to meet its obligation with regard to spent fuel. The standard contract uh, that DOE has with all of the generating companies uh, has a term in it that required the DOE to start removing fuel in 1998. This was actually a provision that was in, inserted in that contract as a requirement from the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982. The liability for that is estimated by the Justice Department because they've not been fulfilling the contracts. Uh, so there's been a partial breach of the contracts and the DOE has been forced to pay damages as a result. The liability for that is estimated to be about $13 billion by 2020 and it has been estimated that that will increase for by 500 for millions per year if for every year of delay thereafter in having some place to move this material. Uh, so there are, uh, there is a issue here of just the cost issue associated with that, but there's also an issue here about the failure of the government to fulfill its contract and breach of trust with the public that has resulted from that. Fourth, let me say that this uh, particular recommendation may offer some benefits as we learn more from Fukushima. Uh, obviously, as you heard this morning, we're examining the issues associated with spent fuel disposition after the Fukushima event. Uh, there's a lot of evaluation that's been going on. Uh, as I understand, the NRC position is that they have confidence that things are safe as they are now, but perhaps they could be improved, uh, and that there is a need to consider whether some possible requirements uh, might come out of that. Among them might be moving materials, of course, from the spent fuel pools into cast storage, which could be on-site or off-site. But beyond that, a consolidated storage facility enables you to move material away from the reactor site into areas that might be less vulnerable to extreme events. Uh, reactors uh, need a heat sink and therefore are near uh, oceans or lakes or rivers, for example, and that was not necessary for dry cast storage. So you, there are there conceivably out of Fukushima, there could be some uh, benefits that, from the pursuit of this recommendation. Fifth, we think that a storage facility could be a very helpful adjunct 
in connection with the disposal facility. And let me emphasize something I should have said at the outset, is that we're making this recommendation not with any idea that there shouldn't be a full pedal to the metal effort to site a disposal facility. That this is something that should be done anyway, and it's in conjunction with this that we think there are opportunities to be able to have a disposal facility, excuse me, a storage facility. Among the things that, that you could do if you had a storage facility is you'd have basically some buffer capacity to be able to move spent fuel uh, from sites on a very predictable schedule uh, without having to stuff it someplace into a, a repository immediately to have the capacity perhaps for enhance the smooth functioning of the disposal facility by having an intermediary facility that could take the material and hold it for the period that is necessary. And of course, if there were a delay in, in the installation of a disposal facility, a storage facility would, would serve the benefits that I've mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, and sixth, and the final support for this recommendation is that I think there's some technical opportunities that arise uh, from it. Uh, there's an uh, enhanced capability for long-term monitoring and testing uh, that could arise that may be necessary. Uh, the uh, consolidated facility, unlike the one of these, some of these decommissioned sites could have a pool, so in the event that one needed to open a canister to evaluate the material, uh, there's lots of, uh, there'd be some advantages for the monitoring and research associated with spent fuel that could sensibly be done in a facility that had not only just storage, but the associated research facilities that are associated with understanding the phenomena that affect behavior of spent fuel over a period of extended storage. So this is really our, our principal recommendation that comes uh, out of this report. Um, and uh, you don't seem to be able to get to our further recommendations. <laughs> you've, you've heard enough already, I guess. <laughs> oh, oh, there we go. Um, the subcommittee uh, has concluded there do not to be, to, be, to be unmanageable safety or security risks associated with the current methods of storage at existing sites, but rigorous efforts will be needed to ensure this continues to be the case. Uh, lots of information on this issue was submitted to the committee initially before Fukushima. A lot of information was submitted on hardened storage. Uh, more recently in Fukushima, uh, there have been concerns about issues associated with storage, in particular with spent fuel pools. Um, and uh, these need to be taken seriously. They need to be evaluated carefully. And as I understood this morning, Phil is going to take care of that over the next uh, several months. Uh, on behalf of this committee. Uh, but in any event, uh, this, there is, although we're not aware at the moment of any unmanageable safety and security risks associated with storage, they could well arise and a very careful evaluation of them is necessary. And let me say that over the longer term, and this bears on the last sentence, uh, that there is research on degradation phenomena with spent fuel that really does need to be seriously examined. The database on that is thin, uh, that we have information on the behavior of spent fuel that has lower burn up than is typical in reactors today and has been in storage for shorter periods of time than we now contemplate may well be necessary. And so uh, it's not to say that, there's, uh, that this is anything that's going to move quickly or that is now we anticipate will be a huge problem, but evaluating it as necessary and taking action as necessary is going to be appropriate. Uh, the third recommendation is that spent fuel currently being stored at the decommissioned sites should be first in line for transfer to a consolidated interim storage facility as soon as such a facility is available. Let me just mention, there may be safety reasons to get material out of spent fuel pools. Safety should be the highest priority. That could be done in dry cast storage that's on a site or it could be done at a consolidated site. But we say for moving materials from existing reactor sites to the consolidated site, it should go, f the material that should move first is the materials at these uh, decommissioned reactor sites. Uh, these are the sites that, as I mentioned earlier, have been waiting for this material to, to be moved. They have uh, land that could be uh, put to better use. Uh, it's expensive to store this material at the decommissioned sites because you can't piggyback on the security that exists at an operating reactor. And there's even potential to reduce costs by getting these as a result 
of moving this material to a centralized facility. So there's lots of reasons why we think that the decommissioned reactor sites should be first in line for the movement of the fuels of the fuel so that those sites can be uh, brought to greenfield status at a, the earliest possible moment. So let me pass the baton to Phil and give him an opportunity to uh, adjust, uh, correct, or uh, modify any of my comments. Uh, I certainly have no modification, uh, uh, and uh, as anyone who knows us individually knows, uh, the superior experience and brain power rests with my colleague. Uh, and uh, so uh, I, I would never, uh, I would never uh, want to get into a debate with him. Uh, however, I might just quickly reinforce something. First of all, I don't think there's any doubt among the subcommittee members that this is a very important and central uh, recommendation, and nobody should misunderstand uh, the intensity with which we approach this as an important uh, step to be taken. I would simply add to what uh, uh, Dick has said that this is already envisioned under current law uh, of the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. This proposal of consolidated interim storage is not at all new. It has been studied extensively for decades in this country, and multiple uh, organizations and commissions have recommended that this should be a part of an integrated strategy for the United States. So uh, this is not something that was suddenly uh, come up, coming up within this, uh, this commission as such. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, it has gone under different names, uh, and so that leads to confusion sometimes in the, uh, the debate about this. Well, let me turn quickly to the last three uh, or four recommendations that we have. Uh, this recommendation uh, gets at the point of having a new organization manage uh, our uh, strategy and the implementation of the strategy for nuclear waste disposal. Now let me quickly say that our subcommittee did not do the work on this, and indeed you're going to hear about it, so I'm going to say very little about it, from the Disposal Subcommittee, which had, did extensive work on this, and Jonathan Lash, and I don't know if the Senator is going to be here or not, uh, will be uh, raising that at 1 o'clock, so I'm going to have a very little uh, to say about it here, other than to say we anticipate that it should have, the new entity to manage the integrated uh, uh, strategy, should have responsibility for storage and transportation as well as for the permanent disposal site kind of proposition. However, a work in progress still in our subcommittee is what do we do between now and the time that we hope to get in place such a new entity. Uh, and I think a number of us strongly feel we should not wait. Uh, it could take three to five years, depending on the speed with which an administration and a Congress uh, decide to act on the proposals or are able to get agreement on proposals, and it will probably take at least a year to stand up any new organization uh, once it is uh, put into law. So uh, given the incredible work and study that has gone on in this, numbers of inquiries from communities around the, uh, the country for different reasons on nuclear facilities, there is no reason to say wait until uh, this is in place. And we're trying to work out how to more specifically uh, identify that, but certainly uh, the Department of Energy uh, uh, under current law and under current uh, uh, facilities can engage in putting together all kinds of bringing together all kinds of important information and advancing the capacity uh, for the siting of such one or more facilities. Secondly, we want to be aware that indeed there, we would do, want to do nothing to inhibit any communities around the country, and when the, uh, the uh, Department of Energy went out looking for volunteer sites for a, another purpose uh, over the last three years, they actually found a number of communities that stepped forward. And so we would not want to do anything to inhibit uh, communities that thought they might have an interest uh, in this facility from being able to step forward and begin. But again, let me suggest to you this is a work in progress as to uh, how we might uh, specifically go about this. Let me uh, turn to the, I think, to the fifth. <laughs> I pushed the right one. Yeah, yeah it's here. Oh, it's here. <laughs> I'm not there. Uh, <laughs> I need one for myself. Um, here we, we turn to the 
uh, it's simply an expression of, again, making use of the incredible work done by the disposal subcommittee. So I'm not going to go through it because you're going to get that uh, yet this afternoon. But essentially what we're saying is that the siting principles and the process used for siting a consolidated interim uh, facility probably should be designed very much like what you would use for the ultimate disposal site. However, we want to be very clear, we do not see these as similar facilities. They have quite different requirements and they have quite different technical requirements that you might have in place. And so what it is not a matter of having uniform requirements. Uh, when you're going for thousands of years of disposal, that is quite different than when you're looking at a, a century or more uh, proposition uh, as, as what we call here as interim means interim. This will not become the permanent uh, disposal site uh, for uh, nuclear waste. Nobody believes that any design that has been discussed is adequate to that task, uh, and so that is quite uh, to be kept uh, quite separate. The sixth recommendation uh, has to do with um, uh, our, our transportation recommendation. And here, uh, in a sense, what we have done is made a major finding that we have in place and we have experience and we that would suggest that we have a very good record of how to go about transporting uh, spent nuclear fuel and other uh, nuclear uh, materials. Um, and uh, indeed, uh, the record is very extensive. Again, this has been studied, and we have a lot of experience going all the way back to 1957, where we both had over 800 shipments uh, by the nuclear navy uh, of uh, spent nuclear fuel. We've had thousands of shipments in the last decade of uh, transuranic waste into the WIP facility in New Mexico, and we've had thousands and thousands of other uh, kinds of transportation go on over m uh, many decades here and abroad, and the safety record is exceptional. However, recognizing that record is not sufficient <laughs> uh, for where we need to get. Uh, and indeed, uh, it's very important, I would simply say, here and here, the, what's in the report will be important, the, the extensiveness with which we try to cover this, is that we have learned from this experience a lot of important uh, principles, uh, including the need for extensive planning, including the need for considerable regulatory oversight by actually multiple state and federal uh, uh, regulatory entities, where we have training in place, not only for the drivers of the trucks, but for local uh, responders uh, through which uh, the communities through which this may go. We have in place monitoring systems in transit. Uh, and we have multiple ways of testing not only the, uh, the casts that are going to store, but other parts of this. And so this leads to the, um, the recommendation that as you begin to site uh, an interim storage facility, once it's in place, it will actually step up the volume of what is in transit, we assume, uh, of nuclear spent fuel. And that planning should start very early. Uh, because it's going to take time, one, because of the extensive coordination that is needed, but two, because of the, the communications and the education and the interaction not only with government officials, but with communities. Because we recognize this is one of the most politically sensitive issues uh, for in many parts of the country where people understandably do not have experience with uh, nuclear waste, the casks, or any of these uh, oversight uh, activities that we have in place. And so they naturally raise questions, and they should be raising questions. Uh, and so you, one must allow that time. And so we strongly recommend that you start this planning process early on. And it includes things like providing financial assistance to the local uh, folks whose cooperation uh, and training uh, to make this safe is needed. Let me turn to seven. Um, and this goes to the question of financing uh, the interim facility. Uh, here again, uh, we're relying for heavy duty work on uh, the disposal subcommittee, uh, which has looked at this broader issue of uh, the financing mechanisms that we have in place. Our central uh, point here is simply that that uh, the nuclear waste fund should cover uh, the uh, interim storage facility. And indeed, it's important to recognize this is already anticipated in the current law. So this is not a brand new concept. It is a matter of making use of a facility have. 
I'd like to take this moment just to articulate uh, two major fundamentals of American nuclear waste policy that we are simply assuming go forward throughout this commission. The first is that the users and the beneficiaries of nuclear power, they are paying now, paying as we go for the cleanup costs that we anticipate, the storage and, by the way, the cleanup at the nuclear at the reactor site. The, the reactor is not part of our discussion, have to have these decommissioning funds set aside, but to pay for the nuclear waste disposal, we have in place the nuclear waste fee, and that, of course, has been building up in the U.S. Treasury, and by the way, remains the legal obligation of the American government, uh, in my view, and I think most people's view, uh, to be utilized solely for the purpose of uh, covering these expenses. In other words, we are not putting the financial burden of nuclear waste disposal on future generations. We, are, we, are, we took that on as an obligation starting in the 1980s. The second half of that policy was the federal government would be the, the entity responsible for the disposal of the nuclear waste. And of course, we've had lots of delay in that, and we're not meeting that obligation yet, uh, as was anticipated under the contracts and the law. Uh, and that is costing federal taxpayers money, and part of the reason for getting on with interim storage is to address that. But excuse me, I sort of went beyond uh, uh, recommendation seven. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. But it deserves a here, here. <laughs> okay, following uh, Dick's recommendation, let me ask first if members of the subcommittee have a comment, and I think uh, Al does have. He's a, he's a member of the subcommittee, yes. I had a, a question, which I think will be uh, illuminating. We distinguish, we have two subcommittees, one on uh, uh, this it, it recommended a consolidated interim storage facility. We also have one on disposal. I think most people have a reasonable idea of what we mean by disposal. We mean permanent, we mean forever, or at least we mean no intention of ever moving it again. Interim, people have very different ideas of what interim means. We sometimes hear numbers like five years before it goes off to reprocessing, or we hear 100 years, uh, depending upon when the disposal uh, facility is available. I wonder if you could do anything to uh, elucidate what is meant by interim in this context? No, I'd be happy to. As uh, the, uh, as you well understand, the original concept was that the fuel would remove from the reactors and relatively promptly would be removed and go elsewhere, perhaps for reprocessing. And that obviously has not happened. Um, the uh, the uh, when we're talking about storage, we're talking about something more in the order of a century than. Is, uh, is conceivable than f the five years. Uh, NRC has been examining this matter and has a so-called waste confidence rule, which is that's the sort of order of magnitude. Uh, of course, uh, other options may arise. It may move sooner, but we ought to contemplate that there, there might be some of the fuel will be stored for uh, those, those sorts of durations. I might one of the uh, theories here is uh, Dick outlined the flexibility to the broad system that having it gets. The facility itself has a great deal of flexibility. Our presumption is it may be you begin with one size, which may be expanded and shrunk as you begin to shift this, this system. It is likely to have the characteristic of being simply storing dry casts. It may also have a pool. It may also be a facility where if we discover 20 years from now that in fact the dry casts are starting to deteriorate, we do not expect that but we could all then repackage uh, if we had to. But interim does mean it's not permanent. <laughs> and it means that, so it may be a facility that's, that gets, reaches a peak and then shrinks back and then disappears. Uh, but one should not, a community should not assume it's 30 years. Uh, <clears throat> Two questions for you. One of the phrases that jumped out at me was one or more in your first recommendation. Uh, what, what is your thought about that? Uh, do we need to be thinking of two, three, four, five of these things? Or do you, do you seriously think only one is necessary, or, or have you given that? Well, physically, for what you have to do, one would certainly do, do the it. trick in terms of volume. But in terms of transportation and where things are located, one can 
we could easily argue it might be wiser to have several sure. regionally located. Yeah. But frankly, uh, I think the siting difficulty will govern that as much as anything. The, the other, the other really question important. I had related to these litigation costs, uh, I don't know an awful lot about this, but it's very frustrating, <laughs> I think, to the American taxpayer to see that they have to continually pay litigation costs here. And I think you mentioned 500, you anticipate 500 million a year or something like After that. After 2020, yes. After 2020. What, what can we recommend, what can we do about that to cut out these litigation costs? Well, it turns out that these matters have been extensively litigated already, uh, that most of the legal issues, I think, have been resolved, although lawyers always can be clever to find uh, new, new issues. Uh, but the, uh, the guidelines that should govern these matters are largely, largely resolved. Um, there is going to be a continuing liability of the government and these until it's able to, to, to rectify its breach. But there are certainly ways to do this much more efficiently than we are, than the traditional scorched earth sort of litigation in the courts. Uh, and some, uh, and we do have this, and it wasn't one that is rose to the level of a recommendation, but in our report I would anticipate that we would strongly urge uh, the creation of either settlements that would resolve these matters or failing that, some kind of an arbitration mechanism, which would be a lot more efficient and avoid the costs that it, or have to be incurred by both sides on resolving matters where the legal issues are now of extraordinarily narrow, if not fully resolved. Okay. I've got three uh, commissioners, Pear, Ernie, and Allison. Pear. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, I think one of the important points that needs to be emphasized is that the standard contracts between DOE and utilities do create constraints, and you can't abrogate those constraints without being subject to potential penalties. In fact, that's why there's this large amount of money that's being transferred from taxpayers to ratepayers right now to pay for on-site storage. Uh, there are three important types of constraints that the contracts generate. The first is that the contracts do limit the purposes for which the nuclear waste fund fees can be used, and this is an important for example, for reactor fuel cycle technology, RD&D, it's quite clear that these monies cannot be used for that purpose. And we need to work within the limitations of these legal agreements in terms of how these, these monies can be used and, and, uh, are, and, how, and how they're restricted. The next important element is that the contracts do require full cost recovery. That is, as long as the DOE and federal government perform, all costs associated with these activities are supposed to be recovered through prospective increases in collections and therefore utilities should be interested in this system working at least somewhat efficiently in comparison particularly to what the performance has been up to date. The, the final part is that the courts have determined that in order to meet the obligations in the contract, Spent fuel has to be delivered at a rate that the DOE thought they could achieve back in 1987. And it's a huge rate. It's 2,700 metric tons per year. That, that, so, so my question for the subcommittee is it may not actually make sense to try to achieve that rate. And in fact, once you've moved fuel from shutdown reactors, in many cases, the more logical thing to do with the system could be to use site storage uh, at operating reactors for perhaps a fairly large fraction as opposed to moving it to consolidated. But it would seem to me that utilities will be penalized. They still pay the same fee, yet then they have these costs to do the on-site. How do we get around this problem that uh, there's a perverse disincentive not to send your material to consolidated storage even once it's available? Well, let me, let me suggest, uh, I don't have the exact answer. We've had discussions at other subcommittees of, about this, and so, but I'm just going to give you a partial possibility here. And that is, you have to remember that going forward, if we can get a clear policy in place, there are going to be real opportunities to renegotiate these things. You just mentioned the possibility that DOE can raise to pay cover costs the, uh, the fee. 
Uh, well, it might be that the utility finds it's in its interest to re uh, negotiate uh, as opposed to another high cost fee that goes on to some system that, uh, as in order to pay them to keep it at the thing. I, I'm not saying that's a good idea. I'm just simply saying that do not think contracts are, are forever and more permanent than this nuclear waste is. Uh, the, uh, the fact is that uh, that is subject to negotiation and uh, but obviously uh, the federal government to abrogate the contract would have to pay penalty uh, do it, but it may find that that's worth doing, by the way. <laughs> Very good answer. Let me supplement that with just come back to one of your points that about the purposes that under the existing litigation, because storage was not a part of the system, these various judgments that are being issued against the government for its failure to comply with the obligations of the standard contract are being paid by the taxpayers. It's from the judgment fund. Um, one of the implications of this recommendation would be is if we actually start to fold a storage mechanism in as part of an overall scheme that leads to the ultimate disposition of the material, then, and as Phil indicated, part of the statute actually contemplates when you use storage in that way, then these recoveries would be borne by the people who benefited from the power, namely they get the, the, the support would come from the fund and rather than from taxpayers. So that there are some fairness issues that are associated with this. And we have had uh, conversations as part of our subcommittee deliberations with the nuclear industry. And, uh, and they have indicated that they very much favor getting these issues resolved in the fact that some of these costs would be transferred to the waste fund from the judgment fund, but actually from their point of view would be a, certainly a fair trade for having these issues resolved in a fashion that gets this, uh, these issues associated with the back end of the fuel cycle off the table. That, that, thank, thank you. And I, I do think it's important, just as a matter of policy, and it is in the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, that, that these costs are internalized into the rates that electricity payers pay. So the waste costs are internalized, which actually is in stark contrast to fossil fuels, where massive costs are external to uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ernie, and then Alice. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, as a member of the subcommittee, I want to say that I certainly endorse the uh, recommendations. Uh, uh, I have a number of comments both on them and on some of the discussion up to now. Uh, one is on Phil's uh, answer to the question of uh, a few versus one uh, possible regional uh, uh, consolidated storage site. I just want to emphasize, at least in my view, it's not obvious which way it cuts in terms of public acceptance, the question of one versus several. It's not obviously, I think, in favor of one uh, because of equity issues, transportation issues, et cetera. Uh, secondly, I just wanted to reemphasize uh, on the liability discussion uh, that occurred, the discussion we had with uh, Glenn Podonsky that, to not forget, there are now, there's another date which is the date for the agreements on the defense sites to move waste, and we need to keep that in mind as another liability, <laughs> a looming liability issue, as we once again uh, find that we will be violating the laws of physics to meet the law. Uh, three, um, I think on the question of Al's question on interim, uh, I, I think we should remember that when we say century scale, we're talking about a planning horizon and not a yes. commitment to keeping it for 100 years because we may decide earlier that it's a waste and we have a place to put it. We may decide earlier it's an energy resource and do something with it, uh, something that will be certainly more towards the century timescale. Uh, fourth, uh, uh, we've had a number of discussions here today and, and many of the recommendations raise the issue of both what Pear mentioned in terms of contracts but also statutory changes. And I think we need to be, frankly, in this subcommittee, but overall, much more explicit uh, on uh, statutory uh, and contract uh, change requirements uh, and perhaps uh, go more into specifying what some of those statutory changes uh, should be. Uh, fifth, I think on the transportation recommendation, we would do well to uh, emphasize uh, 
the European experience. I mean, I think in the disposal, we, we, take, we take advantage very much of, of, of experience elsewhere. And here, similarly, <laughs> the simple fact that Europe has already moved fuel on the scale that we are talking about uh, for 70,000 tons, I think, is an important point to keep always in the, in the foreground. Uh, we're not inventing a transportation system that hasn't been already invented uh, elsewhere. Uh, sixth, uh, on the question of the new organization, uh, while having access to the waste fund is critical, I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that it needs a lot more authorities than just that to, to be successful. Uh, uh, for example, this issue of ordering of taking fuel, uh, if it's stuck with the current arrangements, that doesn't help it do its job. Uh, but also looking forward, especially in the context of potentially other fuel cycles, it's got to have a say in what kind of waste forms and uh, what kinds of waste streams uh, are, are created and not just say, here it is, take it uh, and, and figure out how to do with it. Uh, and uh, seventh, um, as uh, the uh, chairs uh, uh, go ahead on their own to incorporate the Fukushima uh, <laughs> lessons. Uh, uh, I, uh, I, I, I do think that there should be explicit consideration as to whether and how the waste fund uh, is used for all or part of the additional costs in terms of storage that might be, uh, uh, that, that, that might ensue. Would the gentleman quickly yield uh, uh, this co-chair, and I suspect I speak for my other one, have no intention of going ahead on our own without <laughs> a, a conversation with you and the subcommittee and the, the full commission. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and secondly, as you know, I think you rightfully raised the question on the new organization. I didn't mean to brush over that too lightly, except to say that it really is uh, there's a whole package of authorities and responsibilities and whatnot that a lot of time has been spent on by uh, the other subcommittee, and so I was simply incorporate, but I see what you're saying is there are some related to storage and transport. Well, and, and, and it certainly goes very strongly to this issue of what is, what does or does not require statutory uh, action. Absolutely. Well, uh, that, that and, new organization unquestionably requires. Yeah. And, and as far as your, as far as your uh, future work plans, we'll be right behind you. <laughs> Allison. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a, a, just a couple questions. Let me just start where Ernie left off and, um, and say, you know, considering the discussion we had this morning with the NRC about Fukushima and the spent fuel pools, um, I, I just want to get on the record that you guys are going to consider the advantages of moving from the dense rack configuration that now exists in the U.S. pools to an open cage, low density design in the pools. And uh, so that's, that's one question. And then the second question has to do with the size of these interim storage facilities are, and I don't think you mentioned that, Dick, when you were talking about them, but I'm, I'm just trying to get an order of magnitude. Are we talking 5,000 metric tons? Or are we talking more like the PFS size of 40,000 metric tons? Um, what are you guys envisioning? Well, let me say at the, uh, with regard to the, exactly where we go with the spent fuel pools, this is a, issue that is being evaluated as we speak. Um, we don't know, in fact, what's happened in the spent fuel pools in Japan, as we, as we heard this morning. And initially, it appeared that there was a, you know, a complete drain down event and presumably hydrogen reaction with that fuel that caused that, that uh, unit four to, uh, to have an explosion. Obviously, if they didn't lose the water, the hydrogen didn't come from that unit. Uh, and so what exactly has happened? Uh, uh, so what exactly happened uh, with, with that event and what its implications for spent fuel pools is a more general matter, something I think that we just need to watch. And obviously if there are implications for us, we'll deal, we'll deal with them. But I don't, I, I, I would be hesitant in promising that we're going to have very clear answers on that over the next month or two because of the, we don't, we don't understand the accident sequence, right. let alone the implications. But certainly on the, on the table, 
uh, for consideration that is very clearly something that people are talking about is uh, going to getting material out of the spent fuel pools into dry cast storage for mm -hmm. safety reasons and that's very much on the on the on the agenda that uh, that that we should follow right. as to the size of the facility I think that we envision that uh, as Phil indicated that you know initially we have uh, fuel that's at nine sites. It's a relatively right. small volume of fuel. That's the material we'd like to move early. We ought to have a storage facility this that's capable of that. Just to but clarify, the, that's the orphaned fuel. That's at the five decommissioned site. The I mean, decommissioned the nine site. Decommissioned it, site. They're not orphaned. It's not orphaned. They're owners. There are people watching them very carefully, <laughs> but they are ready for it. They're ready for adoption. Exactly right. Uh, so, so that that but that fuel. But then, you know, we start to get out to the uh, the sort of the end of the next decade. There's going to be a large number of plants that are decommissioned, and so you ought to anticipate there's going to be substantial volumes of fuels that need to be moved at that time if we're going to allow them to get the fuel off the sites as they decommission the reactor. So, I would envision an interim storage facility that starts out relatively modest in size, perhaps, but then over a period of a decade or two, will have to grow. Uh, to be able uh, to accommodate the accumulated inventory. Well, just, just one, one caveat on that that I think we should take into consideration is that, you know, it depends on the agreement, I imagine, that you have with the community and the state as to some communities and states may say, okay, well, we're happy to have a, uh, an interim storage facility here. We're going to limit the size of it, though. And that's, that's going to be that. Could be. And uh, you're not going to grow. Uh, so I think we have to take those kinds of uh, potential outcomes in, into consideration? We, we certainly do, but I, let me say that I think that um, part of the discussion with any community should be completely transparent about what we know and what we don't know and what optionality needs to be preserved. And that there's got to be much clearer understandings and uh, commitments on both sides that uh, each side lives with and fulfills. And that's been one of the problems that is in this area is that people have made promises they have not kept. If I could just join a little bit in dampening the expectations that, that as, uh, my colleague uh, just did about what to expect us to recommend out of Fukushima. I think it, it, there is a general common uh, way in which we are approaching many of these highly technical questions in which we are not making technical recommendations at the end of the day. Some of you on the commission have expert and technical knowledge, but many of us do not, and it would be inappropriate for us to declare we know exactly how to manage certain technical things. So while we may talk about direction or we may talk about this is an imperative that, that uh, the NRC should uh, examine and come to a public conclusion about, uh, it's not clear how far we will go in actually saying do X, we know exactly how to manage that pool and what the configuration ought to look like and at what time you ought to get the stuff out of there. Okay, uh, John, also a member of the subcommittee. Just <clears throat> as a member, I certainly agree with the recommendations and in spite of Chairman Sharp's humility, both he and Chairman Reserve have put a great deal of wisdom into this work. Uh, I would simply like to add that, painful though it is to conclude, the, you know, the recommendations of this subcommittee are inherently conjoined with the recommendations of the Disposal Committee in ways that simply cannot be separated. As somebody who really does like clear linear solutions, uh, this the emphasis we have here on an open consultative consensual process uh, isn't entirely a happiness to me, but I'm absolutely convinced it's essential. And more than that, it will only work if it's combined with an equally persistent and effective process for getting an ultimate disposal site. Because one of the things that makes finding an interim site so hard, 
as every member of the subcommittee, certainly the co-chairs, are keenly aware, is that people are afraid there will never be the other shoe dropping. And the problem we have here is that citizens in various states, even relatively insensitive people like utility executives, uh, are suffering the pangs of what they feel to be 50 years of betrayal. Um, and so it is terribly important that we understand that this is a very important part of a constructive process, but it's a part that cannot stand alone. It ties to the disposal subcommittee's recommendations insofar as the new federal corporation or whatever it is is concerned. It ties in that this part of the process only has credibility if there is a newly credible process for getting the ultimate disposal site. Um, and like all things in a democratic society, uh, which has its element of sausage making, it, it requires a process that is both honestly scientific and to some extent commercially interactive with the potential host sites. People who may get these facilities have to see benefits that they see as being commensurate with the burdens. And that turns out to be a negotiation, not an argument. Okay, John, thank you very much. Uh, pointing out the linkages between the subcommittees is an important observation. Uh, Chairman uh, Scowcroft and I kind of wrestled with that when we set up the subcommittees, and we recognize the uh, overlaps, if you will, and therefore uh, the cooperation among the several subcommittees, uh, which has indeed taken place, has been uh, very constructive. Well, thank you, Dick and Phil. Thanks to the members of the subcommittee for an excellent report uh, on the uh, work, the recommendations, of course. Uh, we will cover in the afternoon sessions uh, the review of the draft record.